Support for the Dice Tower comes from listeners like you and from The Op, also known as USAopoly. Thanks for your support. The Dice Tower, Episode 665. Q is for Kroll and Write. Huh? Welcome to the Dice Tower, a podcast about board games and card games, and especially the people who play them. On today's show, Suzanne joins Tom and me to school us in the various options for our top 10 Q games. Plus, Jeff tries to remember his thoughts about working memory, and we answer questions about game agents and managing expectations when teaching a game. I'm Eric Summerer, and here's your host, the Captain Quark of board gaming, Tom Vassell. Uh, thank you, Eric. You are welcome. Very apt description. Um, I, I suppose. <laughs> I don't actually know who this is. Uh, Captain Quark is one of the uh, characters in the Ratchet and Clank series of video games. He is um, a well-respected member of the community. Thanks. And not at all a buffoon. Um, yeah, well I believe respected. you. I believe yep. you. Well-respected, smart guy. Hey everyone, welcome to our show about board games. I'm Tom Vassell. I'm Eric Summerer, and... I'm Suzanne Sheldon! It's Suze! Yay! Suze really wanted to be on the Q episode. In fact, she wrote the title of the show, If You Don't Like It. If you do <laughs> like it, I wrote it. <laughs> yeah, I, I advocated strongly. I, I was calling you... I figured midnight calls, 3 a.m. calls, please, please let me be on the Q episode. And hey, I finally wore you down, so I'm glad to be here. I heard through the grapevine, Suzanne, that, that you were accepting this top 10 list as a challenge. Uh, Tom and I have been sort of a little worried about reaching this letter of the alphabet, and you said, nope, they have no idea. I've got dozens of Q games. I am all set here. I, I mean, I, I had two dozen games on my long list that I cut down to 10. So that is true. That Wow. Well, it is a new day. It is, well, if you're listening to this, it is almost July. The year is essentially half over. Oh it's my been goodness. both the fastest and slowest year of my life. Um, I think, is that is that like a legit thing? Do you all feel like that? Oh, yeah. Yes. Yeah, it's a weird time flux thing that we're... Maybe the, the time... The year's by. going fast, but the days go slow. Yeah. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know what it is. Uh, it's a dizzying feeling all the time. Well, yeah, I really feel like, you know, when I watched Groundhog Day and he, at, at some point halfway through, started experimenting in various ways in how to kill himself. I was like, why would you do that? And, and, and I still don't know that I would want to do that, but I'm starting to see his point possibly. I don't know why I'm on Groundhog Day. What is, <laughs> it, is a, it is a weird thing. It is indeed, though, halfway through the year. We just got done with Virtual Con, and that means if you're listening to this, today is the opening day of the Dice Tower Summer Spectacular 2020. We should be currently at Dice Tower East, and we're not, which is sad. Mm -hmm. But all three of us will be with Mandy today, later on, doing our top 10 board game apps. This is something I used to know nothing about, but thanks to the year 2020, I'm on board. <laughs> no, I mean, seriously, I remember years ago, Tom, when I was covering board game apps in Board Game Breakfast, and whenever you got approached for an app review, you would just forward the email to me and be like, Suzanne, do you, you want to take this? It's all you, you. Your interest at that time years ago were, was pretty low. Yeah, well, uh, you know, I think at the end of the day, like I said, the virtual con was fantastic, and we had a really great time playing games with people virtually through Zoom and and, and apps and stuff. I, at the end of the day, it's just not the same. It isn't. It's, True. it's a it's a substitute that I can live with. I'm I'm happy with what we're doing, but man, I do I still do like playing games with people in in, in person. And to that end, I'm thankful that I have a family that I can inflict at least a few games on. <laughs> it does help to be able to converse while playing a game digitally. Uh, so the use of, say, a Discord server to be able to chat really helps 
uh, at least maintain some semblance of that interpersonal feeling. Uh, even though you are manipulating digital bits on an app or on a, a piece of software, being able to talk really helps as opposed to trying to chat, you know, with a with um, you know, text. That that's harder to do. All righty. Well, let's jump into some board games here, and we're going to start from the bottom, and I mean that literally. So we'll have Eric go first. Oh. That works on so many levels because I am talking about the latest in the series of Flux Games from Looney Labs. This is the SpongeBob SquarePants version. Uh, I'm, he I'm lives ordering it as we speak in a pineapple under the sea. Um, so this is so uh, for over, the, over the past couple of years, uh, Looney Labs has issued a number of these co-productions with Spin Master Games. Uh, there are certain licenses that I think Spin Master had. There's been a Marvel one, and this is the latest. SpongeBob comes in a slightly larger box than traditional fluxes. It even comes with a uh, plastic coin with SpongeBob's face on it, which has a slight mechanical thing in the game. It's Flux. I mean, the joke review is that it's Flux with SpongeBob. I have, let's say I have experience with the game of Flux. Um, it's it's the same general <laughs> feel of the game. Uh, draw one, play one to start the game. Eventually, a goal will come on the table that involves getting these keepers that get played in front of you. Uh, then you can play cards that change the rules of the game. So you're drawing more cards or playing more cards or, or reducing your hand size or all sorts of crazy rules. So what makes a... Um, a, a themed version of Flux. A themed version of Flux is not just the keepers, which are all characters, in this case from SpongeBob, and the goals, which are combinations of those characters, but also every version of Flux has some sort of little twist in rule cards that make it, you know, that, that change the flavor of the game. Um, this one has a couple of new rules. Uh, one is narrator's voice. If you start the turn by saying, ah, the blank, filling in the blank with something from the ocean, you get to draw one extra card. <laughs> I like anything that's narrator's voice. There's one that if you talk like a pirate during your turn, you get to draw one extra card. But if you maintain pirate talk throughout the round until it gets back to you, you get two extra cards. Um, and then that can be replaced by cartoon talk where you have to talk in a cartoon voice. And those are the cards that really make SpongeBob SpongeBob in this version of the game. Um, it has a lot of the, the standard cards in Flux, and, and it is, in that way, just a, a quick, you know, reskin. But there are a couple of things that make it a unique feel. Um, I put this in the same category as the Monty Python Flux or the, uh, the Wizard of Oz Flux, where if you are a, f a real fan of that property, you will enjoy some of those rules that have you doing silly things in that direction. The Python one has you quoting Python. The Wizard of Oz one has you singing Wizard of Oz songs. This one has you talking in cartoon voices and pirate voices. Uh, I think it's a great fit for families. It's still Flux, um, which I'm fine with, as long as you have that meta rule that says if it goes more than 30 minutes, you're done. Um, <laughs> it, you have to have that escape hatch, because it is possible. But there are cards in here that get you cycling through the deck more. Oh, there's... Uh, this this card, Imagination, where if you play that, um, you can pretend you have one of the keepers. Um, and, and win that way as long as no one can disprove you. <laughs> as long as you can't prove that I am imagining that I have the SpongeBob card, then the game is over and I win. Anyway, that's SpongeBob Flux, the latest from Looney Labs and Spin Master. Are you going to get this, Suze? Uh, you know, it, it's not rocketing to the top of my list, but my kids are huge SpongeBob fans. So Ooh. it might end up in my house at some point. Is SpongeBob That's still awesome. making new episodes? Like, is it still a thing? I, I, I've kind of been off the grid. I used to watch it with my It's not making new episodes, kids. but it's making new movies. That is true. Oh. Yeah, there either just was or is just about to be a SpongeBob movie. I think movie. there's just about to be. Yeah. Huh. Hmm. All right. Well, let's go to something equally. <laughs> I can't even. I have no segue here. <laughs> what, what have you been playing, Seuss? Yeah, this is. I was like, if you want to talk about spectrums, right? This is. <laughs> On the, the other end of this the spectrum, the, the Venn diagram here does not have a lot of overlap. <laughs> There's not a lot of overlap. It's me, and that's it. And when I was looking at this game, I I realized, oh my gosh, this game is 20 years old now. And and then I just yeah. thought, Princes of Florence. This is mm -hmm. an old, I guess now, Wolfgang Cromer game. And Wolfgang Cromer is just one of my all-time favorite designers. I love what he does. 
when he designs with uh, Kiesling, Michael Kiesling, I just magic happens. So in general, I'm a I'm a Cromer fan. Princess of Florence is one of the earlier games that used polyominoes, and I think that's one of the things that makes it appealing to me today is that you're basically trying to create your own palace. Everybody gets their own board and, with a grid on it, and then there are a bunch of tiles that are polyominoes in different shapes that represent different buildings or stations that you can kind of put into your – I don't – not castle. I don't, I don't know what the right word is here, palazzo or something like that. And ultimately, I think you're a, a wealthy family in Florence and you're trying to attract the best kind of artistic and scientific talent to your family by making sure you have all the right facilities for them. So you're going to be playing and you're going to be getting these polyominoes to get on your board. I really like the placement element of trying to balance how you arrange these things because there's some placement restrictions that – really force you to plan ahead. And I really like that element. And then ultimately, there are all these different cards that represent different characters that you can attract that have polyomino requirements. Now, if you have played the Magnificent, there's going to be something that feels very familiar here. Or if you played Princess of Florence and then tried the Magnificent, it's going to feel very familiar because basically each of these characters has a building requirement, which is a series of these polyomino shapes on them. And then if you have those buildings, then you can attract that character and get their benefit points and abilities and, and that kind of thing. And that you can actually end up stealing characters from your opponents too. So there's a little bit of player interaction on that front. And, it, you know, it, it feels, it, on one hand, it feels creative because when you contextualize it being from, I don't know, 2000, and using polyominoes in this way, it feels very, very creative. But on the other hand, it also feels very much like a 20-year-old game. And that's an interesting tug of war for me in terms of my ultimate opinion about it in, in context of today. I, I got to say, I don't, I don't think it, it stands up. And I think one of the challenges with Princess of Florence is its graphic design specifically. It, it's, I try to be forgiving <laughs> but I think more than illustration, people underestimate the importance of graphic design in board mm. games and making them playable and making them enjoyable. And I have the Rio Grande version of this. There was also an Aaliyah Robinsberger edition. The font, they use this fancy uh. scripty font that looks like a mm -hmm. paintbrush kind of thing. But you have to see what your opponents have. And it is virtually impossible to read these cards from three feet away, upside down. And mm. if it's right in front of you, it's virtually impossible. <laughs> there is a player aid on your uh, – surrounding your map. There's a – every building is defined in terms of what their qualifications are and things like that and uh, a shape mm -hmm. reference and the level they are. Great. It is unreadable. It is absolutely unreadable unreadable. You are squinting, you are straining, you're going to give yourself a headache trying to read this board. It is yeah. honestly one of the worst graphic design choices I have seen in a game in a long time. And sure, it's 20 years old, but I'm trying to play it today and it's awful. So the gameplay is fine. I think that with the rise in popularity of poly polyominoes, there are other games that do similar things in interesting ways. I think Euro-style games have really advanced, obviously, over the 20 years. So I think Princess of Florence is one of those games that I really respect and appreciate in the context of when it was released. But I don't think this one is going to be hitting the ta table very often for me in the future. I think there's just other games that do polyominoes better. There are other games that do Euro-style play better. And... There are other games that don't give me a headache just trying to read the player aid. So <laughs> Princes of Florence, it's 20 years old. Yeah, the Princes of Florence, the thing about this game is for me, I, I think it falls in that weird category of I, I think the best way to describe it is fragile Euro games mm. where to play it, everyone kind of needs to be on the same level and you can't make a mistake or you you can't do something that allows someone else to win because there's auctioning in the game. And auctioning is fine mechanism, but it also makes things kind of iffy. 
you know, if someone wins an auction for a lot or wins a couple key things at the beginning of the game, you can know pretty early out that, oh, I'm not going to win this. Yeah. Um, graphic design I'm more forgiving on because it came out 20 years ago, but it, you're right. There's so many more modern games that look so much better. Yeah, totally. If you're in a dim room, too, if you, if you don't have good lighting, that font is that much more difficult to read. All I can think of when I, uh, I have played Princes of Florence is the groans from my fellow players when a particular auction goes screwy and somebody gets something super cheap yep. that, that, that you know, they pay 200 for something that is worth five times that and they, you know, are, are now in a significant advantage for the rest of the game. And, and that sort of situation I'm not real happy with. So let's jump 20 years to a very modern game. <laughs> this one is Tekkenu, Obelisk of the Sun. This is the newest game uh, from Boards and Dice. They Ooh. are uh, making a series of games starting with T, apparently. This mm-hmm. one is uh, designed by uh, Danielle Tacchini and David Turtsy. Mm-hmm. And I don't know if you've all seen this one. It comes with this giant obelisk with dice that you pull from a bag and place around it over the course of this game. I don't know if, if, if you all have seen this one at all. Or? Yep, I've seen it. I've seen the pictures, but I haven't seen it actually working. I know there's a shadow mechanism where you can't operate in certain sections of the board based on where the sun is. Yeah, kind of. I was really disappointed by the shadow because I, I, I thought, ooh, uh, the shadow on the board. But that, there's, 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 there's no physical shadow thing at all. Uh, it's hmm. just a, it's a spinning disc. In fact, the obelisk is completely unnecessary and sometimes blocked part of my view of the board. Um, oh. So the obelisk sits in the middle of this rondelle of sorts. You roll dice and put them in these different sections. And based on whether that section is in light or darkness, different dice will be available to take or not. Some dice are just unavailable. You know, For example, white dice you can't take during the, the day and black dice you can't take during – no, white dice you can't take during the night and black dice you can't take during the day. You know, Something okay. like that. Um, the dice are equally good in other all other aspects, but some depending on when you you take a die, you, um, you will also place that die. Sometimes the dice are good, and sometimes they're tainted, and you put them on two sides of a scale, and you want that scale to be balanced because if it's balanced, you won't lose points, and it also you'll go first, which is a really big deal. This game has a huge first turn advantage. When you take a die, you can either turn it in to get some resources. So, for example, if I take a six black die, I'm going to get six resources of the black uh, – I want to say it's marble or limestone. I forget what the colors stand for. Um, but different resources, uh, except you can't take too many resources. And you're greedy and those extra resources get thrown on the scale. That's one thing you do when you take a die, but most of the time – You'll take a die, and depending on what section it is in, you'll get to activate a that god's power. And that god's power brings us to typical Euro game stuff where you build temples and pyramids and <laughs> pillars and score points in various ways, and everything interconnects with each other. And that sounds snarky, and it is a little, but, I mean, the game is still quite good. It's just that describing that, you know, I'm not going to describe each of what the sections do because, again, you've seen this stuff before. The mm-hmm. actual... What the hook of this game is, is the fact that you take these dice, you pick whether you want the resources or to use the power of that god, and these dice are, there's only so many dice. A few get added each round of the game. I think you take 16 dice over the course of the game, and you have to make the right decisions and then utilize them to their full effect. That's what I like about it. It all works together. It is definitely a jumble of mechanisms in a box. The theme, whatever. Someone tries to tell you there's theme here, they're stretching. Uh, but I still enjoyed it a lot, and one of my favorite things is there are tech cards that you can get, and they give you these crazy awesome powers that can change how you play the game considerably. And there's way more than that involved, but so far this is solid. I don't think I like it better than their last game, which I have a hard time pronouncing. Um, Tahuan Tin Suyu? Teotihuacan? No. Yeah, that Teotihuacan. one. Teotihuacan? Yeah. See, you both said it differently just now, <laughs> proving my point. Eric is yeah. always correct. Eric I'm gonna call is this one. always correcter than me. That, that's not true. Uh, but yes, I, I think it's Teotihuacan with emphasis on the final syllable. You know, I, I'm, I'm at the point now where I think they're enjoying the naming of these games. There's, there's actually two of the games from this company that are coming out that are have the letter 
T in right. the start of them. That's and that's the one I was thinking of. Uh, Tawantin Tawantin Suyu. Tawantin Suyu. Well, that one I've not is, played yet. That's that's also coming out in in the next couple of months. I think that's the quote unquote Essen release. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, I was thinking of the one Suzanne said. <laughs> People are like, you need to say the name of the game more in the episode. Not this one. <laughs> um, Tech Henu. It's a solid game in this line. And I know people compare them, but at the same time, I'm not necessarily comparing these games to each other. But I would rather play this than, for example, Princess of Florence. It's new. Does it have lasting power? I don't know. But I really enjoyed it for what it was. Well, uh, my next game is one that does have a theme I really enjoy and embrace. That is Clank in Space. That was pretty it's mild, space. Eric. I, I'm, I'm trying to save, you know, build up to later in the episode. I'll yell more later. It is a, a deck-building adventure uh, where you are racing through a spacecraft trying to steal an artifact uh, from uh, Lord Eraticus, the evil villain, and uh, escape before you are destroyed by him and his minions. Uh, what I love about the mechanism is that you have to, um, you know, you're moving around using deck building mechanics, using symbols on your cards to move around through obstacles uh, all over the place. And you have to collect data cards, data codes, in order to get into the section of the ship that has the really good point scoring things that you need to get to in order to get in and out. Uh, There are ways to transport around. There's transporter pads. There's a cool elevator system that you can access. There are keys that will, uh, you could buy a key and it'll let you move around uh, the rooms better. I like this system better than standard clank. Um, and the reason I'm bringing it up is uh, we, we had talked about the virtual con. I had the opportunity to play this over Tabletop Simulator with my brother and was teaching it to him. He had never played before, uh, and he enjoyed it. I still enjoy this game. I haven't played any of the uh, uh, expansions yet. I, I'm, I'm thinking I might need to explore those because I still really enjoy the base game. But the reason I wanted to bring it up is it it is – I'm finding it – an interesting challenge to teach a game in the virtual space mm-hmm. when you are – because usually if I am um, you know, in front of a group of people and I'm trying to explain, I can do a lot of very specific gestures and I can point at things very quickly and I can look into the eyes of the people I am teaching. And when I'm looking at a tabletop simulator uh, rendering and even if I'm, I'm talking on you know, a headset, I can hear them and get – auditory feedback from them, but I'm not sure that anyone is necessarily looking at the thing I'm looking at because everyone right. has a different view of the board. Um, I just learned about this. You can hit the tab key in Tabletop Simulator and, and put a little arrow at stuff, which I found much very helpful. Oh, I love so when I can people say, do hey, that. Look at that. I'm sure you don't. It, no, it makes I a do. Little, okay. It makes a dinging sound and sort of says this. That way, you don't have to necessarily – you know that people can look at something and it keeps that arrow there for a couple of seconds and every, you can draw everyone's attention to something and explain something. But that was a significant hurdle in, in getting – like I'd say, all right, look at these cards and you'd be like, what? wait, what? What are you looking at? No, over here in the lower left corner of mm-hmm. the board um, and, and having to be a little more descriptive in my explanation. Um, and, but, but learning – the the keyboard shortcuts of the highlighting tool and um, and ways to get that information across uh, has helped a lot in teaching virtually. Still, Clank in Space, great game, and I need to look at those expansions. Nice. Well, with the title of an episode called Roll and Write, you know I had to include a Roll and Write in my discussion today. I feel like you have one in your back pocket all the time. Just I, ready to talk about. I kind of do. I've got it's a big on the table backlog. Here. <laughs> I haven't played this one yet. Well, this one is brand new, so I'm sure you will get around to it. This is Floor Plan from Deep Water Games. And it's a very straightforward roll and write in which you have a sheet, two dice, and some scoring cards. And that's basically it. Hmm. And one of the things I love about Floor Plan, and I think that we're going to be doing some Floor Plan for Gen Cant and that kind of virtual gaming thing, it would be great for the virtual gaming con, is that you can play with as many people as who have sheets. And I think that that's a wonderful thing about Roll and Write games, that they have that scalability. Floor Plan is about designing your house or your 
property, essentially. And when you roll dice, you get to make a choice between using the value of the dice to add a room or to use the dice to add a feature to your property. And so if you roll a two and a three, you will get to draw a room that is two squares by three squares. Because when you look at this sheet, it's literally just a grid. It looks like graph paper, but it has some nice reference materials around it. And then you would label it, let's say you want to make it a, a closet or something like that. You would write a C for closet or a B for bedroom or a D for dining room, that kind of thing. Because the the rooms also have a number assigned to them. So if you do a two and a three, you can only use the rooms that are two or three. Or if you choose to use the two and a three for, for features, it could be trees, it could be stones, it could be doors or windows or all sorts of things. And every every game, there are three different scoring cards that come out. There's three different types, building, design, something like that. And they're randomized in there. So there's a lot of variability, which is really, really cool as well. So you're going to go through the game and you're going to take turns rolling dice or one person can just roll the dice and then make the decisions that you make with the the dice features that come up. And at the end of the game, you will be scoring how well your property takes advantage of the scoring cards that were out for that episode of the game. Now, there are some things that you can do. You can earn bonuses as you achieve certain things so that you have a little bit of flexibility in case you get a bad roll or something like that. And that's really nice to unlock those bonuses to have a little more control over how you do the game. And in general, I really, really like floor plan. Now, there is another roll and write game that isn't well known, especially in North America, because it's out of the Asian market and it was never really translated or brought over, called Madrino, that also has a concept around doing this architecture floor plan idea. But those are the only two I know of right now. And I'm shocked that there's only two because it's such a brilliant idea for a Mm -hmm. roll and write game. It's just fun to lay out these architectural grids and And think about, oh, I want a tree here. Or if I build enough stones over here, I get to do this. Or, heck, I I need a toilet. Okay, I guess I'm putting the toilet in the dining room. Why not? (laughs) Um, it's, It's a lot of fun to go through and kind of envision and see this structure evolve and emerge as you are dealing with the dice rolls. And I have a lot of fun with it. So floor plan is a hit for me. It's interesting. I played a prototype version of it ages ago, and it's really cool to see how it's developed over the last couple of years because the game that they have today, that if you were to buy this game today and get the box, is significantly better than the game that I played in prototype form two years ago. Mm. So when I got my copy and played it, even though I, I, I knew what I was getting into, I really extra enjoyed it. And so Floor mm. Plan... If you like roll and write games, if that idea of the architectural schematic and layout is appealing to you, I definitely recommend this one. I've had a lot of fun with it. I am looking forward to giving this one a whirl. Uh, yeah, there's a lot of new roll and write games that are coming out. Uh, it's definitely the flood of them is over at this point, but I think that's probably for the best. Now, hopefully when they come out, they're all really good. All right, I I just remembered I played this game and need to talk about it rather than one I was going to talk about, and that is Cosmic Encounter Duel. Wow, how could you forget that one? I Well, because there's been a – yes, there's just a lot going on. Um, Cosmic Encounter (laughs) Duel is Cosmic Encounter for two players, but it is – I wondered how this would happen. When when I first heard about this game, I was not as – I mean, I got many emails. People like, I bet you're super excited. Like, not really because (laughs) – the whole thing I like about Cosmic Encounter is the negotiation, and I found that in most negotiations with two players, I often lose. That's because <laughs> it's usually where we're going to go out to eat, and my wife just tells me where I'm going out to eat. Um, yeah. So I, I didn't know how that worked. Well, they just basically – there is no negotiation. Cosmic Encounter Duel is essentially – it brings all the chaos and nonsense and weird things that happen in Cosmic Encounter – to a two-player game, and then leaves out the negotiation. It is kind of like a big rock, paper, scissors to some degree. As the game goes by, you're turning over different cards that you are fighting over. And some of these cards are planets. The first person to control five planets wins, although you also have a bunch of ships. And if you lose all your ships, you can lose that way too. So there's two main ways to lose. So all these, uh, you'll flip over a planet. 
you both send out up to four ships to this planet, and then you'll play a card. Each player has their own deck. You play these cards and do all kinds of crazy things, powers and all sorts of things that will happen that will change the outcome of that and try to outguess the other person using your special powers. They added all new alien races. None of these are in Cosmic Encounter. Cosmic Encounter has 251 uh, different races or something like that. Uh, wow. These are all new, which makes me highly suspect there's another Cosmic Encounter expansion coming hmm. with these races in it. I might be wrong, but it just seems weird that they didn't go back and use some of the races that are in Cosmic Encounter. This is not compatible at all. This is not the same thing. It has some the same artwork. It has the, the, the ships are the same. It's very possible you might like this if you don't like Cosmic Encounter. And it's possible you'll love Cosmic Encounter and might not like this. I will say, if you don't like craziness, this will not appeal to you at all. Hmm. Because there's just really insane stuff will happen. I play this, but look at this card does this, and oh, boom, bop, you know, and stuff happens all over the place. Um, yeah. Yes, you still are trying to outguess the other person. I don't want to make it sound like it's complete randomness. It's not. But there's a good chunk of it in there, too. I found it to be hmm. very fun to play. Doesn't hold a candle to Cosmic, but that's because they took out my favorite part, Negotiation. But it's a nice way to play that type of game with two people. Hmm. Sort of. <laughs> ah, it's such a weird game to review, right? <laughs> um, in fact, I think at some point, and by the way, we're talking about Cosmic Encounter Duel. I think at some point, <laughs> we should designate a whole episode where we talk about the two-player versions of bigger games. Yeah, mm. for sure. I, I'd love that. That's a great idea. Yeah, because sometimes they're superior. Sometimes they are definitely inferior. And sometimes they're the same game, so why did they make a two-player? And sometimes they're like this completely different game. I mean, there's just right. a lot of different right, ways about yeah. it. I mean, we could do this like three times. You could do it with the, the two-player versions of games, the card versions of games, and the dice <laughs> versions of games. Yep. In fact, it, funny, funny enough, I have photos that I've taken of all of the big box and their kind of little sibling games that I've taken <laughs> over the years. So Seven Wonders and Seven Wonders Duel and things like that. Uh, I've got a whole – like I've got like 20, 30 photos of all of these pairings and it's a lot of fun hmm. to think of them in that context. It is interesting. I, hmm. Well, we'll have to come back to that. All right. Meanwhile, we're going to get going. If you missed – it in the announcement today when we started um, uh, Summer Spectacular, which is going up pretty close at the same time as this, we got some new T-shirts available for the Dice Tower it's starring our uh, superheroes and Ooh. also the, you can get a Dice Tower East T-shirt even though it didn't happen. You can pretend <laughs> you went <laughs> or okay. a Summer Spectacular shirt. Up to you. But we got lots of new T-shirts available. You can find a link on our website, Dicetower.com. With that being said, all three of us, we think we're smart, but we must bow before the master, Jeff. Three, two, one, go. It's time for Game Tech with Jeff Engelstein, where we find out how games really work. A few weeks ago, Tom and I received an intriguing email from a listener named Eleanor. Eleanor is a huge board game fan and has been playing games a long time. She is very accomplished, but has recognized that there's a particular quirk in the way she thinks. Here's an excerpt from her email. Quote, I have a very poor working memory. Working memory includes your ability to hold on to and manipulate data in your head, being able to do stuff like multiplication and addition in your mind. It doesn't affect your reasoning ability or your intelligence. It also affects my ability to spell, but there aren't that many pure spelling games like Scrabble around, so normally it doesn't play that much of a part in board gaming. An example of how this affects me is with two similar deduction games. Zendo is one of my favorite games, but no matter what, I can't play Cryptid. With Zendo, I can think of one rule and then accept it or dismiss it. With Cryptid, you have to think of multiple rules at the same time, and I can't hold all that information in my head at once leaving me just staring blankly at the board, end quote. All of that results in Eleanor enjoying games, but tending to rarely win those that require working memory. However, the lockdown changed things in an interesting way. Continuing from the email, quote, When lockdown happened in my country, we moved to our local club to online, normally on board game arena. 
suddenly I started winning, and people who normally consistently won started not winning all the time. At first, I brushed it off as a fluke, but when it kept happening, I realized there was something more going on here. That's when it occurred to me that on Board Game Arena, most of the math is done for you. In Stone Age, it tells you if adding a tool will increase your haul or not. And in a more simple example, in Can't Stop, it lists out all the possible number combos from your die rolls. Suddenly, I didn't have to spend time working out math and could save my mental power for more important parts of the game. But not only that, suddenly the people that unknowingly always had an advantage because of their working memory didn't have that advantage anymore. It leveled the playing field. End quote. Now she ends with three questions. Do board game designers realize how much a player's working memory can affect their ability to play their games? Should we just accept that having a good working memory is an innate advantage when playing board games, just like having good reasoning skills is? Or is it just an unintended side effect? And are there things that can be done to mitigate the advantage in real life, similar to how games nowadays make things colorblind friendly, while still having meaty choices and interesting strategies? And before taking a swipe at those questions, first a quick definition of working memory. This is a subsystem of the brain that keeps active, short-term information before either discarding it or combining it to longer-term storage. Our thinking about this part of the brain has progressed rapidly over the last 20 years. At first, we thought it was just a single system. Now we realize it's actually multiple subsystems. The three most important are the inner visual system, sort of a visual scratch pad, the phonological loop, which processes words and sounds, and a central executive, which deals with mental arithmetic and coordinates the other two systems. To study these, experimenters gave subjects two different tasks to perform at the same time and looked at how much their performance degraded. For example, one experiment gave people a task to memorize a list of digits and another to answering reasoning questions. The time required to do both of these tasks was only a fraction of a second longer than doing only one of them. But when given two of the same type of tasks to do at the same time, memorizing two lists of numbers, for example, working memory could not process them in parallel. This showed that there are two different systems that can work independently on different types of tasks. Now, my favorite game demonstrating working memory is Rapid Recall. In this game, a clue giver has a list of 10 words. They need to give clues to the guesser to guess each word, and they can say anything they want other than the actual word. And when the guesser thinks they know the word, they don't say it out loud. They instead just throw a chip into the tray and have to remember it. And after time runs out or all 10 words have been guessed, the guesser now has to remember the list and say them out loud, getting points for each one that they recall. It sounds easy, but it is surprisingly hard. I've seen people completely freeze and only be able to remember one word or even none. In all the times I've played, I've only been able to get all 10 one time, and it was a struggle. So back to the questions. Do you remember those? Now, the first and really kind of the second as well was whether designers take working memory into consideration. I think that they do, perhaps not explicitly, but I think that trying to smooth out play, have icons and reference cards, tokens that match the shapes of the spots where they are played. These graphic design techniques are all geared towards minimizing the amount of extraneous material you need to keep in your brain at any one time. I also recommend to my students that they stay away from die modifiers for this reason as well, particularly multiple modifiers that stack. You can see people start to fuzz out when you have too many of them. I think, however, that it is inevitable that some games will simply test this skill. Games test all kinds of skill, math, dexterity, planning, probability, improv, logic, and yes, working memory. And none of those is makes a superior game to any others. They're just different games for different audiences. No game will please everyone. As a designer, the key is knowing what you're going for and the experience you want to convey. Thanks so much to Eleanor for sending in this thought-provoking email. This is Jeff Engelstein with Game Tech. So I think Jeff brings up uh, an interesting point here in that um, we we treat some things in the world of board gaming as you know part of the the normal uh, stuff that gets exercised. Um, you know, memory is is one of those skills that we often test in games, um, and and that's. But then we make concessions for um, you know other uh, areas where people might have difficulty. And where is that dividing line? Is an interesting discussion. Um, this sort of goes into the 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 
discussion of whether you are allowed to take notes during a game. Right. Um, that this has come up before, and and often my you know my gut reaction has often been why why do you need to do that? But not realizing that you know everyone is coming from a different position and might this may help you be able to play the game better. It's not just about maximizing points or or APing the whole thing. This might allow you taking a couple of notes might help you just be able to process everything more easily. And so I think I I feel I'm more. I would be more lenient of that if I saw it in the future. That's cool. I personally, I thought it was interesting that when they converted from playing in person, but now that they're playing games online, it's it's working with them in a different way. I personally don't care for games that have strong memory elements, typically because my short term memory is not great, and、mm. that made me think, hmm, maybe I should see if there's some games online that I've struggled with physically to see、yeah. if. I also experienced that kind of shift, so that was another great game tech. Oh, that Jeff! Oh, that Jeff! That we should put that on a T-shirt. That's the name. That put, that's the new name of the show. In the, in the <laughs> next, <laughs> that's the Disney Channel spinoff sitcom. Oh, that <laughs> Jeff! Hey, folks! Today's show is brought to you by the Op. Uh, also used, that's known as USAopoly, and today we want to talk a little bit about their featured game Hues and Cues. Actually, you can watch me play this online if you want with people.、So、Hues and Cues is a game that my whole family really enjoyed playing. It's a big board that's just full of just a color swaths, all these different colors,、uh, and you are trying to connect colors to words. You're going to get a color on a card, and then I might say the word apple, or I might say the word, you know, sunny. And you gotta. Everyone's gonna try to pick that color or get close to that color on the board. There's hundreds of color squares. Four hundred eighty colors, to be exact. What? That is a lot of colors. So green or red. You know, probably red is for apple. But what if I had just eaten a green apple that this morning? Either way, it's a lot of fun. <laughs> and you're using one or two word cues and trying to get people to guess. But you can also get close to the answer and get points. And so it's a lot of fun as everyone will sit there and argue over what color you should have. Actually said, and it holds a whole pile of people.、Uh, very much recommend it.、Uh, Hues and cues. It's available at Op Dot Games or at your favorite game retailer near you. Questions. 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 Thomas says, "Hey Tom, I just listened to episode six fifty three, where you read a question about the possibility of a game agent." That would help designers get their games to publishers. Well, I live in Austria, and in Vienna there is a game agency that does just that. It is called White Castle Games, and they mainly offer three services. One, as an author, you can send in your prototype and pay for blind playtesting, including detailed review and commentary. If the game is good and they see potential, they will shop your game to a publisher and help you get it approved there and to publication. They also offer author meetups and other opportunities for networking. Two, as a publisher, you can have them deliver to you polished prototypes of the kind of games you are looking for. So, for the publisher, they are getting exactly the kind of game they are looking for, and save on development since the agency does a lot of this. Again, through a network of blind playtesters and some full-time employees. And three, as a business that has nothing to do with gaming potentially, they will design a custom game for whatever you want. So, learning games for corporate settings, advertisements, or whatever. A friend of mine works for them as a playtester. He gets a small compensation for this or credit to be spent on games. I have actually playtested a game with him before that I have later seen on the shelves published by Ravensburger. The agency has existed for several years and seems to be doing well, even though the corona, even through the corona crisis. They also have a website at www.whitecastle.at, but it's all in German. So good luck. I just thought this would be interesting to you. Keep up the good work. Always love listening to you. Well, thank you, Thomas. I put this on the show here because、uh, you know Suze works with a publisher, and I was curious what y'all thought about something like this. Like, as a publisher, would this be something you'd be interested in, or would you rather hear directly from the designer themselves? I wonder if it's a cultural thing to some degree, right? This is coming out of the European market, and I feel like in the U.S. it operates a little bit differently. Now, restoration、mm. is unique. Because 
they don't take pitches, right? They don't have to, because of their core brand and taking older games and restoring them, they don't often, they don't, like, people with their random game designs that they come up with, that's not something that Restoration is going to be publishing. So uh, their experience in that realm is a little differently. But when I think about all of my friends in the publishing industry that take pitches, so much of it is interpersonal and so much is understanding and hearing from the designer. I'm sure that there are people that would love polished prototypes from an agency like that, but I, 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 I sense that there may be something cultural about that kind of system in that established market versus how it works over in North America. Mm. It but does It does seem like, um, and, and again, this is wide generalizations, but it does seem like uh, a lot of the American-based publishers do operate on a little more loose relationship. It's it's more direct interpersonal. Whereas when we've gone to Essen for the show and um, and dealt with some of the larger European publishers, there are, for lack of a better word, more hoops to jump through. Um, because it is more of an established business, the game publishing industry, um, and, and it just seems like there are there are more official channels to go through, if that makes sense. So having an organization like this, where it, it is, it's actually a game agent, which is pretty much everything that we were asked about back in 653 uh, with this White Castle organization, uh, it, it adds a little bit of legitimacy to, uh, to a submission to a publisher. It's sort of like um, just anybody writing a script and sending it to a movie studio or that script coming from an agent. Here, here in the in Hollywood, uh, that's how it goes. You, you know, studios aren't going to just open up every script that somebody sends them. They need to see it from an official channel, and that may be more necessary in Germany and Austria. Right. Hmm. Hmm. Next question comes from Fern, and it's for me, I guess. How do you pronounce the word slash condiment Worcestershire? <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. I, we don't often get questions like this. I'm sorry. <laughs> I say Worcestershire sauce. Worcestershire. Oh, I say Worcestershire. I, I don't believe – I looked at all of the possible uh, pronunciations and I don't think any of that – none of them were that. I, oh, I have fine. heard – No one is saying that I pronounce anything Worcestershire. Correctly. Worcestershire sauce. But Worcestershire. I just say give me the steak sauce. It's a lot easier. Um, I say and, Worcestershire. But that feels very wrong now. <laughs> I feel like this is a setup by Fern, and, and no offense, Fern, but I really feel like there's Fern really just needs like a ringtone or something yeah. of Eric saying Worcestershire or however you say it. So I feel like you should just give her a nice clean Worcestershire. Yep. And and if you're a few miles north into Massachusetts, it's Worcester sauce. There's way too many, I can't too few syllables joking. in that pronunciation for that long of a word. <laughs> Worcester. All right, let's go to some real things here, Mark. So he's catching up in episodes today, and on a recent episode, we talked about Old Maid. Uh, now, Old Maid, <laughs> there's nothing that really justifies the existence of this game currently, <laughs> right? Yeah. Not only is the theme pretty bad, um, but the gameplay mechanisms are kind of like, oh, you get stuck with the Old Maid, you mm -hmm. lose. But we wondered if there was a way to stick that in a modern game, and Mark mentioned Jamaica has a similar mechanism, and that's true, because in Jamaica, you draw cards, and sometimes you get a curse card. Mm. And so someone else can, when they steal from you, they could draw it out of your hand, and then you're like, hey, 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 you know, you got my curse card. Um, uh, but that may be the only one I I could think of. I'm sure there's other games like that. Oh, uh, there was a there was another pirate game with the gold coins, uh, dread, dread coin dread or something like that that had a, something along that line too. I guess it's the pirate thing. Oh, you're right. I forgot about right. that one. Yeah, I forget what it's called too. Hmm. Uh, let's see. Bill writes in and says, My stepdaughter and her band were on the road to play the South by Southwest Music Festival when the pandemic hit and have been quarantining with me and my wife. So now oh, wow. we have five players in the house instead of two. I, right? <laughs> <laughs> a, look, Tom, look who's talking. Come on now. I've introduced the new folks to Sushi Go, Wits and Wagers, and some other games to everyone's delight. Eventually, I decided it was time to try out Pandemic. With only the base game, it plays four. So I was the quote-unquote game master and explained it to everyone. I tried to be removed from the game, but would occasionally nudge them this way or that and say things like, don't forget your special ability. Uh, 
Well, of course, they lost, but just barely. They would have won in maybe three or four turns, but ran out of player cards. Most of them seemed astonished that the game was over and that they couldn't do anything to fix it. They claimed that I didn't make it clear enough that the only path to victory was collecting cards to cure diseases. I felt Wait, awful, but at the same time, I was pretty sure that I'm a decent enough teacher that I told them the win condition and said, yeah, I think I hinted a few times not to forget your cards. So my question is this. Is there any way in teaching a game to cover your bases and lower the expectations or nip in the bud the disappointment if players miss something and lose? For medium weight games, it seems hard enough to explain every rule so that most of the time the players themselves are saying, okay, I get it. This isn't the first time I've been involved as a player or teacher in a game and someone says, with great frustration at the end, you never told me I couldn't do that or could do that. When I hear that, I'm thinking, yeah, I did. Uh, so, <laughs> note, I did get on the Brink expansion almost immediately after, so we can all play together. And another note that their stepdaughter's band is called Bandits on the Run, and you should check them out. Thanks, guys, and keep up the good work. As a small note, not a small note, you really should check <laughs> them out. I did go listen to their music, and I was astounded. I thought they sent it. I was astounded, I think, by the low number of oh. views compared to how good the music well, was. Well, if they were going to play South by Southwest, then I would assume that they've got some chops. Yeah. Yeah, it's pretty neat. Um, but uh, yeah, okay. So the band. Cool. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, what do y'all think here? I, so, yes, managing expectations is tough, and I, I don't know if there's any way to head things off. Uh, you know, you never know how a particular group is going to deal with a game, a- and sometimes you are just surprised by something that you thought was very clear. And and the subtle hints that you were giving were plenty clear. First-time players of Pandemic often run into this problem. They are focused on one aspect of the game, and they forget to pay attention to another. That is how you lose the game. Um, I think the best approach would be, yep, you lost. Let's set it up and do it again, now that you know that. Let's just play a second time. And And that, you know, getting back on the bike, as it were is the best way to get over the frustration of a co-op game. That's, that's how it's supposed to be. You're not supposed to win every time. And, and being surprised by some aspect of it is part of that process. I don't think it's unique to cooperative games, though, too, because I True. think I've been in games that I've been the teacher or games I've been the player. And I would say it's greater than 60% of the games. The first play games with the group, somebody says... I didn't know that. Mm. I didn't hear that. It's just part of the teaching process. And I, whether or not the rule was taught properly or not, there's so much information coming at you when you are learning a new game. It's virtually impossible, I think, to remember every single little nuance of the rules. And so for me, when I'm with my friends, they all know, you know how Tom has a law of gaming, right? The Tom Vassal law of gaming. If a game is good enough, it'll get reprinted. Sure. Well, I get a law of gaming too, right? I was okay. inspired by you, Tom. And so the Suzanne law of gaming is first game is a mess. <laughs> that's, that's not the actual phrasing, I'll be honest with you. It's got some slightly more grown-up words in it. But oh, the first okay. game is always a mess, and that is the Suzanne Law of Gaming. And so it's great with my group because typically we get into the game, somebody goes, oh, I didn't remember that rule. And then it's like, well, Suzanne Law of Gaming, first game's a mess. Yep. And you kind of have to – I think it's more about that really super-duper upfront expectation of, yeah. hey, it's our first play. Things are going to happen. Let's play quickly and get acclimated to it so that the next time we play, we can go and get really real on it. The only other recommendation I have is if the game has player aids, make sure people have them and understand how to reference them. If there's only one player aid in the box, which is sometimes annoying, if you can in advance make photocopies of it and have spares or make sure people have links to the digital version online so they can be referencing them on their device if they choose to do that. Uh, if game doesn't have a player aid on board game geek, a lot of people create personal, like little homemade player aids that can be a help. And a lot mm-hmm. of times those player aids will help smooth off some of those edges or forgotten rules because it'll be laid out there. So that's my only other suggestion if you want to work on that. 
So in the moment, when someone says, looks at you and says, I wish I had known that, I would have played totally different, uh, is a good approach, is empathy the right approach to say, yeah, I get it. Well, the first time I played this, I totally forgot about X. And yeah, it was a, it was a messed up game. I totally hear you. Is that, is that a good approach? Or is that just going to anger them further? What do you think, Tom? <sighs> Now, here's my thing. I don't understand why this is even a conversation. This was a cooperative <laughs> game. It wasn't like he was playing against them. Why didn't he just step in and say, "You look, you're getting low on cards? He, well, I think I he did. I don't get that. I, I think he was, he was giving them hints. You know. Well, I, I think he was trying not to be an alpha right. gamer, but it all depends. Some people like the alpha gamer when they're learning to play a co-op game. Not, not that you're telling them what to do, but like, oh, just so you know, this is going to happen here, here, and there. Yeah. Um, I, 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 I don't know. The, these are also adults. <laughs> I've seen the band, right? So I feel like if if you're pushing them too much, they they could have just I don't know. I after listening to the music, I'm on the band side. <laughs> nice. <laughs> that is a very, very unhelpful <laughs> metric. I realize. Okay. This. Uh, this happens to me every once in a while, and I always just tell people we didn't put money on the first game. There's no money yeah. in this game. Yeah. I won't write a record of it. I won't crow online and be like, I beat Joe Smith in the other day, and he didn't understand the rules, but that's his problem. Yeah. It don't matter. Who cares? I, 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 I got to figure out what Suze's actual phrasing is, and I'll start <laughs> using it. Yeah, I don't think you will. <laughs> I don't think you want to. I have guesses, and I don't think you'd want to. Okay. Jasmir says, I felt that recently games on Kickstarter are needlessly getting more and more expensive. In my opinion, games with giant boxes full of content warrant $100 price points. It seems to me more common Euro games on Kickstarter are riding the coattails of those bigger games by now trying to charge $60 to $70. See the reprint of Tribune. Sometimes these are second editions, so I'd expect they'd be lower than average price since the rules are mostly established. Just wanted to know your thoughts on the subject. Am I wrong? The Tribune is seventy bucks. I just looked it up. Um, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I didn't want. I didn't want to be the first one to jump in. The thing, the thing of the matter is, and when we keep saying this all the time, is if you think a game is not worth the price, then don't pay it. True. The market. I, I really believe that the market corrects in that regard. And for every big expensive game, there are cheaper, easier games to buy. I mean, a whole pile were just released at Target. You know, of games that are have a fairly decent price point. Uh, when these games are really expensive on Kickstarter, they are either high-quality components or the company is overpricing them, in which case, who cares? Um, in the case of Tribune, is it worth what's in the box? I'm not convinced on the components myself for this particular game. However, with this game coming back in print, the older one is going to be cheaper on eBay. So hooray! <laughs> Well, and I think you look um, at companies like Asmodee, right? They just announced recently that they are increasing the MSRP, the standard retail price, on a number of games for the first time in 10 years, 15 years. Ticket to Ride, mm. been out there for years and years without a price increase. But supplies, manufacturing goods, cost of manufacturing has gone up, but the retail price hasn't gone up. Uh, and And – I think that people don't understand the economics of manufacturing games and the cost of materials that go into the game. Moreover, I think that there's a really complex distribution system that creates a weird perception about what the retail price is versus what the people who actually design and create and make the games take financially from that. And Games are more than the cardboard pieces and the plastic pieces in the box. Games are literally years of work from designers and developers and illustrators and graphic designers and rules editors and coordination with manufacturers and things like that. And I think that one thing I see often in this hobby that I wish people would kind of evolve on a little bit is – not just looking at a box and the components in it and having that be the sole element for return on investment that they're mm -hmm. assessing the game on. I'd love for people to really look at all the people that put hours and hours and hours and hours and hours of work into making that game happen as well and consider that when they're looking at the price of a game. 
Right. And and just because it's a second edition of a game doesn't mean it was just hit reprint and do exactly the same thing that was done in the previous edition. There are revisions. There's, you know, the rules were probably rewritten from the ground up. Uh, new art design, new component design. It It's not as simple to do a second edition as, as it might appear at first. So there's a couple other things, too. First of all, on a very pragmatic le- uh, level, if you think games are too expensive, then get into the used game market. Oh, yeah. Because seriously, games value drop faster than anything else I've ever seen. Uh, with the exception of maybe five to ten games a year, almost every game is like half, then a third, then a fourth, then almost nothing. Then five dollars. You get games really yeah. cheap. <laughs> but... Uh, Sue said that people don't really understand manufacturing. I agree on that. And I also don't understand the very simple concept of inflation. I, 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 this is always about people like when I was a kid, games didn't cost as much. Right. Neither did bread. Yeah. Neither did everything else we buy. I, I remember paying less than a, gal- a dollar a gallon of gas. And I remember when I was a kid, games were $30, $40. If they're $70, $80 now, that's, that's legit. They're also 100, not 100 times, but many times better quality wise. Now, again, if, if, if you think they're too expensive, that's legit, then just don't buy them. They're luxury items. There are other cheaper games. There are many, many games in Kickstarter that cost 20 30 bucks. Indeed. I like the idea of the secondary market because you can get those Kickstarter releases from one or two years ago for significantly less. Publishers are less excited about us promoting They are, yes. 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 My God, just wait. It will get cheaper. No, <laughs> no, no. Now. Now. <laughs> It's a balance. It's a balance. <laughs> Well, thanks for all the questions. With a Q, yes. It's a Dice Tower Top Ten. The Dice Tower's Top Ten list is brought to you by The Op, also known as USAopoly, at theop.games. All righty. For some people, you might have thought that this would be the hardest letter. It is actually not the hardest letter um, mm. because we live in the year 2020. And so many games have come out, and people are desperate to think of new names. Uh, so they have these games start with the letter Q. In fact, I think sure. it's I'm guessing X, X will be the hard one, right? X and maybe Z. But uh, after this, after Q, we got R, S, T, U. That's going to be easy. V, yeah. I'm just going to write Vassal for all of them. <laughs> and um, Vassal Presents, yes. Va- you might have to combine like X and Y or something like that, or X and Z. I have it in the yeah. past. I know I've done this before. Okay. Well, we'll figure it out. Maybe maybe by the time we do it, they'll create a bunch of games. Um, I, I almost put Star Wars Queen's Gambit on this list because I never call it Star Wars Star Queen's Wars Gambit. Star Wars Queen's Gambit, yeah. I just call it Queen's Gambit. However, that's technically not the name, so I'm not going to do it. And it's probably right. not going to be big enough to – the S list will be really easy, right? So <laughs> that it might not even make that list. It's going to be all Star Wars games. Um, yeah. Yes. Now, if we had included the games, you could do a top 10 of just games that have the word quest in their title. Mm. Right? So if you ever get desperate for a different approach to Q, that's an option, too. Sure, <laughs> when we're done with the alphabet, it'll be games that have the word quick in them. <laughs> <laughs> games well, containing the word forest. I, think you, I don't think you should necessarily... Wait, that because that's just, what you're planning to do? No, that was just a question in our – we just did the um, a, a game show for Virtual Con, and one of the questions are, what are the highest ranked games with the word and in them? Uh, <laughs> oh. It's wow. trickier than you might think. That is hard. Yeah. So, okay. Anywho, let's jump into this. Uh, uh, well, well, we'll do commentary on the way. Here we go. Number 10. I'm going to kick things off with a roll and write. I am not what? the expert. A roll and write? I know. I am not the expert of roll and writes here. But this one has uh, been a hit for my extended family. My parents love playing quicks. Uh, it is a, a very simple one, very abstract in style, uh, just roll and dice, and, and you're sort of completing rows uh, in quicks and and trying to do it uh, before your opponents do. Uh, it's it's one that has been a hit for my folks, which is pretty much why it's on the list here. Also, my list was getting a little thin. So number 10, quicks. I, my number 10 well, is before, Quiddler. Before, before I, I, I want to beat up on Eric real quick. Oh, um, yes, please. Please do. My biggest problem with Quicks, I, I like roll rights more than I, I let on, but Quicks feels like 
it is the epitome of selling something that people can just own. Mm. There's like almost no proprietary stuff in that box at all. At least with many roll and writes, there's some sheets that are interesting. Mm. <sighs> Quicks. It's very basic, yes. Uh, but it's still ranked 740 on Board Game Geek. Okay, well, it's a hit. Yeah. All right. Yeah, I mean, I get that though, Tom. That goes back to what kind of what we were talking about just a few minutes ago. Yeah, you could you could make a quick sheet in Excel in a graph. You could hand draw it if you wanted to, if you just looked online. But somebody, we all had dice at home, and we all had paper at home. But it took somebody coming up with a game, yeah, to make out of it. No, right? That, you could say that, that about true. Yahtzee. You could say that about a lot of things. I'm just not convinced that this one st- this one doesn't stand out to me at all in the crowd. But fair enough. But Tom, also, have you tried any of the variant sheets for Quicks? I have not. And just mm. so there are just a heads up, at I probably least won't. four variants now too. Interesting. Tell me more about this later. Mm, I shall do. Can can we talk about my number ten now? Yeah, sorry, sorry. Please. <laughs> my number ten is a game called Quiddler. Quiddler is a mass market word game. You get a deck of cards with different letters on it. It's like Scrabble with cards. Uh, except you get more and more cards as you go along. So you start your hand with three cards. The next hand will have four, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It is definitely one of those word games that depends on you having a strong vocabulary and being able to be creative with the cards that you have in your hand. And it is a game I have played dozens upon dozens of hours of because I have a group of friends from college and we would get together during the summer and go camping together. And Quiddler was the game we would take. And just with all those hours of gameplay underneath our belts and all the fun that I've had with it. It's light, it's portable, it's quick and easy to teach. If you like word games, Quiddler is so simple and basic and fun. So Quiddler is my number 10. Uh, I've never actually played Quiddler, I don't believe. I'm looking at it here, the picture of it. The, The font used as the big letter in the middle seems to be really hard to read on some of these. Yeah, it's pretty ornate. It's it's they kind of went for that illuminated letter look. Mm. So yeah, it can be a little complex. Nah. All right, my number ten is is well, it's higher on Suzanne's list because she beat me when I wasn't expecting it. Number nine. Number nine for me is Quirkle. Uh, this one also gets the extended family bonus. My my uh, mother really enjoyed playing this. It's sort of crossword with these nice, chunky, symbolic tiles. You're trying to complete sequence of these, sequences of these uh, colors and symbols to to. F- Earn points uh, in a crossword style. It's it's a very simple approach, but the production is solid uh, with these thick, chunky, painted tiles. It's a it's a mass market hit. Quirkle number nine. I honestly am so ashamed. I forgot about Quirkle, and it may have made my top ten. Oh, I was if surprised I had... that Eric's list is the only one that made it on. Actually, <laughs> yeah, I, that that I think that was a miss on me. Mm. Mm. My number nine is Corridor. This is one of those wooden, typically wooden abstract games for two players that you can see from Gigamic Games. It's, I don't know how old it is. It's been around forever. Where basically you're placing pawns and little wall pieces on a gridded board, trying to make a path for you to go from one side to the other while blocking your opponent. It's simple. It's beautiful. It's challenging to play there are a lot of games that do similar things but Cor- corridor is a classic and is my number nine i agree classic for sure yeah i like just using this as a <laughs> maze making tool just playing with it as a toy yeah my number nine is also the only time this is mentioned and that's queen domino i know everyone loves king domino and king domino is a very popular gateway style game i find it just to be a little too simple for me queen domino kind of steps it up a notch not to mention you can mix them together and the expansion for king domino uh can does work with queen domino too so Hmm. yeah i like this one a lot queen domino my number nine Number eight. My number eight is going to show up on someone else's list in a bit, so I'll just be here trying to figure out how to spell 11 billion. My number eight is also higher on somebody else's list, so j'arrête ici. Ooh. Blah, 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 blah. Mine is also higher on someone else's list because they got there first, but that's probably because they just drew better than me. 
Ooh, clean sweep for number eight. Number seven. Number seven for me is also <laughs> coming up. I'll be here upgrading my dice. <laughs> this is a.、Uh... Maybe there's not as many cute games out there as we thought. <laughs> My number seven is not higher on somebody else's list. This is Quingo. When Tom said that we were going to do Q, I laughed because there's a whole series of roll and write games that they decided to name with the letter Q. Thankfully, many of them are quite good. And Quingo is one that I feel flies under the radar a little bit. It is a roll and write game with a single custom die, and you get a sheet with columns on it. And one of the best things about Quingo is you are going to call out a column based on the die, and then the person who is rolling the die says a number. And then everybody has to fit that number into their sheet in that column. And that player interaction, the playing atten- paying attention to what other people are doing, the kind of freedom of calling a random number, it's not random, but calling a number freely is really intriguing. And it creates a lot of energy in this game.、Mm-hmm. It used to be known as top 12 in Europe. And when it was brought over, it was called Quingo. And it is worth taking a look at if you haven't played it before. I find it to be incredibly fun. So, what is it about the letter Q that says dice? I think it's probably what Tom was saying is people are desperate to find unique ways to name their na- right. name yeah, it's in this market. Yep. So, the Quingo is from the same publisher as Quix, actually, Eric. And th- I would play Quingo pretty much any day over Quix. I think they're both easy to learn. But Quingo gives you a little bit more control, being able、hmm. to pick the number you want. Maybe I, you should try this one out. I should try it and maybe give it to my mother for Christmas. Which is like tomorrow. If, 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 I'm, if I'm measuring this year's <laughs> speed <laughs> correctly, it could be last week. It could be, I have no idea. All righty. My number seven is Queen's Necklace. This is an older, well, it was just reprinted actually. It was an older Bruno f a d u t i game, originally from Days of Wonder. Um, and then recently、uh, reprinted by c o m e on. C- Queen's Necklace is a game about the Three Musketeers, and you're trying to create this necklace, this jewelry to catch the Queen's eye, something like that, blah, blah, blah. You're just essentially buying cards from the middle of the table, and there's little discs on these cards, and the price of each card goes down each round. And you have a certain amount of essentially virtual currency to spend on, on your turn. And knowing what to buy. The original game actually came with an actual necklace, which the Days of Wonder president told me was one of the worst ideas they ever had because it was really <laughs> expensive to put this necklace in each game. Sometimes man- some manufacturing stuff is more expensive than others.、Mm-hmm. And no one liked it because <laughs> it didn't add anything to the game. Like if you get the Queen's necklace card, you're supposed to wear the necklace. A lot、mm. of people just didn't want to put a necklace on. Right. So, you know, I don't think. I've ever worn a necklace in my life. But I've worn so many badges. Well, I, what is a tie other than a tie a fabric is, necklace? It's close, closer to wearing a rope.、Uh, I mean, no, it is neck lace right there. It, you're right. Well, actually, I've worn、tie. a necklace once and it was playing this game because <laughs> I remember playing it. Someone's like, well, I'm not putting a necklace on. I'm like, fine, I'll wear it. That's right. <laughs> Just to show you. Look at, look at my necklace in despair. Queen's Necklace, my number seven. Number six. My number six was on Suzanne's list in the number eight position. That is Quebec. Quebec is、uh, an area control game. You are collaboratively building these buildings in different areas of the board.、Uh, one interesting mechanism is you, you influence these four. Zones, four sort of、uh, spheres in the corners of the board. And at the end of every round, these score in a weird cascade pattern.、Uh, and, and if you are leading or, or win in one of the zones, you can actually spill over into the next zone, which could cause you to win that zone too.、Uh, it's, it's sort of a, it's a system I haven't seen anywhere else.、Um, a, a tricky area control game, Quebec. My number six. Yeah, I feel like Quebec is one that not a lot of people. Especially gamers that are a little bit newer to the hobby have had a chance to check out. But it's definitely, I really enjoy everything you said, Eric. And if you have a chance to give it a try, I think it holds up quite nicely. Yeah, it's from 2011. I didn't realize how old it was. <laughs> Time flies. Oh, boy. My number six is higher on somebody else's list. So I'm just going to let the tension build up. 
Mine is the only one who, uh, on this list, Quad Heroes. I'm going to guess both of you have not even played this one. No, it's really expensive, right? I backed it on Kickstarter, and I have my Kickstarter edition, and I have not even had a chance to open the box. Oh. Ah, well, Quad Heroes, it, 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 is a, it is an expensive game. It's a really pretty game uh, with these little quad dudes. They're like just cubes, and they have faces on them, and each one is painted. Well, no, they're not painted. You have to paint them yourself if you want to paint them. But each one has like a, one that like looks like a tree, one looks like a rock. And then the game itself is kind of like Robo Rally, where you're going to program your movement, move these little cubes around the board, shoot at each other. But when you move them, you kind of flip them over, blip, 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 in different directions. And depending what side is showing, will give them different stats and such when you do an action with them. It's very fun, actually. Very cool components. I like them a lot. Uh, and I like, I don't know, it just feels like something different. You know, a lot of times you look at games mm-hmm. and things and they all, oh, that looks the same as this thing. Quad Heroes, you're not going to get it confused with anything else. Hmm. Number five. My number five is showing up on somebody else's list. I'll be here trying to stuff all these dice into a metal tin. <laughs> my number five is higher on somebody else's list. I'm actually going to go check and make sure my robot vacuum is on. Hmm. All right. For some reason on Earth, this is not on Eric's list, my number five, but it is on Suzanne's list, and that is the recent Days of Wonder game, Quadropolis. Actually, it may not be recent. It's a couple years old now. Mm -hmm. Quadropolis is essentially a city-building game of sorts. Most city-building games are just about putting the right tiles in place to get points, and this is no different. What makes this one unique is how you take the discs. I mean, how you take the the, the, – I'm sorry, not the discs, the the tiles. Tiles. Because they're in this grid and you're placing arrows on the outside of the grid, allowing you to take tiles and really irritating other people who wanted those same tiles. Or at least that's how I found it. Yes. Uh, it has beautiful components. It is a ton of fun. It has an expansion, which is good, but not necessary. The base game has a base game and an advanced game. And I like them both. I think I like the advanced game better. I think this game was severely underrated. Um, to the point where, you know, it's not mentioned in Days of Wonders' top games, but I think it's quite good. And it's my number five, but also on Suze's list, what what, what did you think? Yeah, it, it's just one below you on my number six. Completely agree with you. I think that that grid, the way that you obtain the tiles through that drafting, I guess for lack of a better word, is just a fabulous mechanism and really elevates the game. Of course, it's a Days of Wonder game, so all the components are wonderful quality. And similarly, yeah, I think it's just a little bit uh, not under the radar. It's just there's so many games coming out. It's hard to keep them all elevated. But Quadropolis is one that I own. It's in my collection. It's not going anywhere. I love it. And uh, I'm glad that we got to do a queue list Maybe if we did a city building list, I wonder where Quadropolis would fit on that one. Mm. Hmm. But in Q game, it's definitely worth being on this list, Eric. What? I <laughs> I have yet to play this one, and, and you know, actually thinking about it. Oh my it, gosh! Yeah, well, it's it like you said. There are so many games. This one, I saw it and never got to play it, and then it whoosh, now it's it's gone. Other other games have uh, you know appeared in yeah. front of it, and now that I think about it, I don't think I've played a new Days of Wonder release. In a long time. I think all of the most recent Days of Wonder releases are ones that I have not seen. Um, and Quadropolis was maybe the first of that swath that I've missed. Hmm. Number four. My number four, much like a Zeppelin circling around, keeps showing up in our various top ten lists. It's Quicksilver, the game about Zeppelin racing that Don't I adore. Don't use the word and, our. Uh, Say my. <laughs> our lists are uh, graced by the presence of Quicksilver. <laughs> I, I love it. It's, uh, it's got a cheeky sense of humor and uh, lovely art, and uh, I like shooting weapons at other Zeppelins and, and dodging um, mines that are on propellers. Number four, Quicksilver. Uh, going back earlier in the episode, Jasmine, if you're looking for a really inexpensive game, yeah, Quicksilver. <laughs> I think probably, Ouch. yes. My number four is another in the gigamic abstract game line, and that is Quarto. This is actually lower on Tom's list. Indeed. But uh, also made your top ten. Well, and 
Quarto is a simple connect for game where you have a myriad of wooden pieces. Some are light, some are dark, some are round, some are square, some are tall, some are short, and some are hollow and some are solid. And you are simply trying to connect a line or create a square, depending on what variant you're playing, of four pieces in a row that share a single attribute, at least one single attribute. The twisting Quarto is that you choose the piece that your opponent has to place. And that twist is just enough to make Quarto sing and really withstand the test of time. I will also say that Quarto is one of the games, the first games I played that got me into hobby games back in the 90s, back when I was playing Magic the Gathering in the rear of a dingy, dusty local game store. In between matches, what would we play? Quarto Hmm. would come out quite frequently. So Quarto, I've been playing it for literally decades. I still love it. Great game. My number four. Hmm. And Tom, your number? My number, my number 10. A, a few, uh, not a few, a decade ago, I had some people come to my house. They were just visiting uh, the school. They were like this traveling troop of performers, and they stayed at my house, and I showed them my games, and they said, oh, well, you know this game? You put four things in a row, but we don't know what it's called. So I went to Board Game Geek, and I asked. I was actually mocked for asking because people were like, yeah, you know what this is. Like, well, no, I don't. And then and so I was like, all right. So I hunted it down, played it. And I was like, wow, for an older game, and it's not a new game, but for an older game, it, it's pretty solid. It takes the idea yep. of putting things four in a row, and I don't know. I just found it to be very enjoyable. And the component quality, as most gigamic games are, mm-hmm. is pretty good. And I think this one's probably still in print, actually. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. It's definitely in the Dice Tower Library. That's Quarto, my number 10, and Suzanne's. Number four. Four. Uh, remember the beginning of this episode where we used the word crawl and write? <laughs> yeah, that was, was annoying, probably, right? Yeah, that was annoying. So if that does bother you, you're not going to want to play my number four game, Quarriers. <laughs> also Eric's number five game because Quarriers is fine. So they took Warriors and put a Q in front of it. But if you read the rule book or all the expansion titles and the back mm. of the box, mm. yeah, they might like the letter Q too much. Overused is the word that comes to mind. <laughs> well, the word that comes to mind is quite different, but uh, yes, sure. <laughs> Overused. No. What is wrong with you? No. <laughs> Eric. Bad Eric. That's right. Quarriers is a dice drafting game. It's actually the prequel of sorts. Um, not the prequel. What would be the, the precursor? Pre- precursor of uh, Dice Masters, which I really yes. like. Um, but Quarriers did it first. It was a dice building game, like a deck building game, except you had dice, and then you would use these dice. The game itself is good, although it faded for me a bit until the Quartifex, I know, expansion came out for it, <laughs> which I thought added some nice boost to it. Then Dice Masters came out, and WizKids immediately stopped supporting Quarriers. Mm. But you can still get it and play it. It's a lot of fun, I think. I do appreciate that it's a closed system, whereas uh, the, the Dice Masters just keeps getting bigger and expanding and you know, they, the, you can get the sets of couriers, and it's all sort of in there. Uh, I yeah, I really enjoyed this, especially when it first showed up. Um, and, and it's it's got the deck building concept, but you're building with dice and and uh, you know choosing what to add to that bag. It's a it's a neat neat system, um, and one that I've played in app form with the children, but not physical form, which is weird. I should do that. Couriers. Yeah, what's really sad is I love the Couriers app. I played a ton of Couriers on iOS on my iPad. I, I think they killed the app. Yeah. So if you have it on your device, it'll still run, but they're not supporting it anymore, which is a shame because it was a very good app. Mm. Number three. My number three showed up on Suzanne's list in the number five slot, and that is Quirky Circuits, the cooperative uh, programming game uh, where you will be guiding a cat on a Roomba or a a robot dog or a sushi-making one-armed robot. Uh, to do various things and and achieve goals, it's it's got sort of the the storybook set of boards, and everyone has a different challenge with different goals to complete. And you are collaboratively playing program cards to achieve these goals, but you're not allowed to speak. Um, so 
the the more cards you play in a round, the more efficient you will be, but the more dangerous it is because someone might play something that you don't expect, and you might end up in a place you don't want to be.、Um, it but you only have so many、uh, activations, so much battery power. Each time you activate your program, you spend one battery, and so you can do little tiny programs of just five cards at a time. But that might not be the most efficient way to complete the board, and that balance is tricky. It's quirky, one might say. Quirky circuits number three. Such a fabulous game! I love it, and that's one of the games that Mandy and I had in our games that make us smile. Yep, list just a little bit. I, I recall this. I, I really feel this is a weird one. I was just talking to、um, Jason about this the other day. That I feel like. There's something wrong with me. It feels like this should hit everything I like about a game, and I just don't like it.、Hmm. I,、Ugh. I don't know if it's because, and and yes, Eric, I went back and fixed the thing. Okay.、Um, we I actually reviewed it on a, a previous episode of the podcast like, a few、yes. months ago, and、yes. then Eric said, "Did you play that rule right?" And I was like, "Shut up, Eric!" And so yeah, we, we deleted, deleted my the review, whole thing, <laughs> <laughs> and I went back and played it the correct way. But I still, I don't know what it is. I don't. I like programming a lot. I like programming games where other people can mess me up by accident. I don't like the cooperative programming where I need to read other people's minds. I、mm. just for some reason that combo doesn't work for me. But that's why that it's still a solid game. A lot of people like it. It just doesn't work for me.、Mm. Such as that's how it goes sometimes. My number three was earlier on in Eric's list,、yes. and that is. Quantum.、Mm-hmm. Quantum is actually a game I just spoke about a couple of episodes ago in our Game Pie around space games.、Mm-hmm. Quantum is a kind of area control game with battle because you're flying your ships around and fighting for control and dropping control cubes, and your ships are dice. And the pip side that faces up determines different things,、uh, different values for your ships, and it is. Just an incredible amount of fun. I love Quantum. I sadly think it's out of print right now,、mm. and I really hope somebody brings it back because I think it holds up to today's game standard. And Quantum is an excellent Q game and an excellent space game and just an excellent game. I, I really like the、uh, the creative use of the pips. It's not just rolling. There are mechanisms where you do roll the dice,、uh, which is sort of a crazy way to upgrade your ships. But but the fact that they They represent certain powers and abilities and strengths,、uh, and and you're not necessarily rolling them all the time and, and spreading them out on the board. It's a novel way to use dice as a mechanism. Yeah, in, in some ways, it's similar. It has some elements related to Quad Heroes, from what I understand. And、hmm. what faces up is what's meaningful in the moment, and and I like that element a lot. My number three is a game that many people haven't heard of. It was a small print run, I believe. It's a little abstract strategy game called Quinamid. A lot of people may have played Pentago, which is a get five in a row、uh, by placing a marble and then rotating part of the board. Quinamid ups that by you place a disc and then you can slide the board or rotate a board. It's a really cleverly put together game. I like it a lot. I'm a, I'm a big fan of four in a row, five in a row. This is the second one on this list,、um, but I just enjoy it. It might be tricky to find at this point, but it, if you can, it's it's a worthwhile two player abstract game. Quinamid. Number two. My number two showed up on Tom's list as a number eight game. That is the Quest for El Dorado. This is Reiner Knizia's take on deck building. Deck building tends to be a race. Many deck building games are races. You're racing to a certain number of points, or or、uh, sort of reaching the end of of something, triggering the end game before the opponents trying to be more efficient.、Uh, Quest for El Dorado really brings that to life because you are. Going from point A to point B, it is a race game.、Uh, as you move through terrain and spend your symbols to move forward, but you are also trying to build your deck. So spending your resources to either move or purchase cards is a difficult tug of war.、Um, and trying to be more efficient than your opponents, there's also、um, barriers that. The leader has to get through and spend extra resources to get past, but those that come after them don't have to pass that particular hurdle and can sort of try and catch up.、Um, I have not played the more recent edition of this. There's a standalone expansion that I haven't tried yet that I would really like to. 
The Quest for El Dorado is a, a lovely race deck building game. Number two. Yeah, I, I also really enjoy it. Uh, not as much as Eric, I think. Um, but, I mean, and that's just measures of, of ability. I have yet to play the expansion, which I'm looking forward to. But it, it's a nice mix of deck building and racing, for sure. My number two is higher on at least one other person's list. At least. So I will just hope this doesn't blow up in my face. Speaking of blowing up in your face, my number two, I mocked when I first heard about it. Mm -hmm. In fact, me and Eric talked about it because it sounded ridiculous. And that is the game QE, which is Eric's number eight. This game in which you bid on tiles and you can write down any number in existence ever. But... Whoever spends the most money at the end of the game automatically loses. And my games go into numbers so high I have to look them up. <laughs> it's dead truth. Um, and I just – I don't know what it is. It feels like the game should be broken. It's not, I don't believe. Yeah. But for me, this put board game tables on the map. Now they have a lot of great little games, uh, board game tables, to the point where they really need to change the name of their company. Right. Um, but Just I really board like games QE. at this point. Uh, yeah, I I am terrible at this game. Uh, QE is almost more psychological experiment than it is straight up auction game because you part of the game is figuring out what the parameters are that you're dealing with. Early auctions will go in the thousands. And then later auctions are billions, trillions. You know, the the key is when does somebody jump it up to the next level, and and when do you hold back and and hope to get something for cheap? And I am not good at sussing that out. That doesn't mean I don't appreciate the game. It is an interesting experience for sure. QE. And finally, number one. Number one was hinted at. Uh, by Suzanne. This is the Quacks of Quedlinburg, and it looks like Tom and I sync up here. Uh, this was an easy pick for the best Q game. This one has been a success for um, for for a lot of groups of people that I've been playing with. My kids love this. My college buddies love this. My wife loves this game. I love this game. Um, the, the push your luck aspect, I love, uh, you know, hoping that those really powerful chips come out in a particular order and and the tension of whether my potion is going to explode and the the various powers of the same chip can mean something totally different in a different game. The expansion is solid. It's all fantastic stuff. Um, I I really love the Quacks of Quedlinburg. And, um, spoiler, I just did the, uh, the, the calculations for my top 100. This one's up there. This one's up there. Anyway, Quacks of Quedlinburg, my number one. How about you, Tom? Also, I just love this game. I, uh, it, it's one of the few games where I would say if you own it, you might want to check out the upgraded bits. Normally, I don't care if people get upgraded bits or not, but the Board yeah. Game Geek upgraded bits are fantastic. I love Push Your Luck, and it's, that's what this game is. I like Push Your Luck and then customization, and it lets you customize your bag any way you want. And every game I play, I try different strategies, and I have fun every single time. I could come in dead, dead, dead last, and I still have a great time playing this. Hmm. Yeah, it's excellent, and it was my number two. I'll play this pretty much any time. I do have the upgraded bits. They are lovely yep. and it just it couldn't quite squeak into my number one spot, but it was very, very close. So so what beat out Quacks, Suzanne? Well, perhaps surprising no one, my number one is a Roland Wright game. What? And that is <laughs> that is Quinto. Quinto is a small box roll and write game that existed in Europe for a number of years until, thank goodness, Pandasaurus finally picked it up and brought it over. Mm. Unfortunately, a lot of the energy had moved forward. A lot of roll and writes had entered the market since Quinto first released. It kind of, I feel, got lost in the shuffle and lost in some of the roll and write cynicism that emerged, which is a shame because Quinto is excellent. Quinto, if you, if you like Welcome To, I really recommend you check out Quinto because Welcome 2 actually has some elements similar in Quinto where you're going from left to right, filling in numbers. You have kind of some free choice in where and when you fill in numbers. They have to ascend from left to right and that kind of thing. But it's a pure number play and it is played with dice. There are three, ro- three rows, three different colors, and 
basically you roll a die and if you roll the orange die and you roll a six, you write a six somewhere in the orange row. Now, if you roll an orange and a yellow die and you roll an eight, collectively, cumulatively, you roll an eight, you can put the eight in the orange or the yellow spot. Hmm. And ultimately, you're trying to fill in as many of the spaces ascending from left to right. And you're also calculating some column scoring, which really requires you to extra plan and think ahead and be strategic. And... it seems like such a simple, straightforward, kind of dull almost concept in terms of just rolling numbers, just writing it down. But the weirdest kind of energy emerges because everybody plays on every turn, which is another thing I love about mini roll and write games. You're always engaged. And about halfway through the game, when people really care, people have set up their structure, then I find people are. You know, I, Tom, roll the purple die. I, I have all these purple spots open. I need you to roll the purple die. And you're looking at my sheet going, mm, I don't need the purple that badly. And so there, it, or when everybody near the end of the I game and you need that. a high number. And so then I've literally been in many games of Quinto where people are chanting, roll them all, roll them all, <laughs> roll them all. For such a simple, straightforward basic roll and write game. There's tremendous energy that comes out of it. It is very thoughtful. You can be strategic. You are playing with odds. Quick and simple to teach, but has a nice depth of play. Quinto, I've played it. I can't even count how many times I've played it. I love it. It's a phenomenal example of a roll and write game. And if you have not checked it out, I highly recommend you do. And it's good enough to edge out even a wonderful game like Quacks for my number one. Okay. Woo. Well, there you go. What did the people say? For what did the, the people 10? say? Cute. Well, number 10, Quarto. Hey, that's tied with me. Number nine, Corridor. Hmm? Green. Actually, that tied Suzanne. Woo-hoo. Number eight, Quantum. Mm-hmm. Oh, they were one off from Eric. Sure. Number seven, Quarriers. Come out and play. Number six, Quicks. Number five, Queen Domino. Number four, Quirkle. Number three, Quest for El Dorado. Number two, Quadropolis. And not even a close number one was Quacks for Quedlingburg. Very yeah. much that well, game. Has... We got them all then. That's true. We managed to cover it everything. also was the letter Q. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and there was three lists to go through. If, um, we, we, if, if Suzanne hadn't been here, we wouldn't have mentioned Corridor. You know, so yeah. there you go. Yeah. Well, that's it, folks, for another episode. Thanks so much for joining us. Don't forget the summer break. spectacular is going on. You can watch stuff. You need a break? Yeah. Yeah, I think we all do. What should we do? Uh, let's just take a week off. Let's let's take a break. Yes. Okay, folks, we don't do this very often, but we do need to take a break at some point over the course of the year. So there will be no weekly episode next week, but then the week after that, Mandy and Suze will be back and we'll – Keep going on. We got the whole year scheduled out, I think, and so we hope you all enjoy it. Yep. Thank you, Sue, for joining us today and talking about Roland Wright's so enthusiastically once again. <laughs> no, no, no. Thank you. Know, you. I, I, it's I, always I, fun to hang out with you guys. I think it's good to talk about these things because, again, that comes back to at the beginning where someone talked about games being expensive. The games that we talked about here, many of them are quite inexpensive and That's true. fun. Yeah, yeah. So the next time, I'm Tom Vassell. I'm Suzanne Sheldon. And I'm Eric Summerer. And you've been listening to The Dice Tower. Thanks for listening. Promotional consideration has been provided by game publishers in the form of review copies of games. This episode number 665 was recorded on June 27th, 2020. As Tom said, we are off next week, but we'll be back in two weeks with Mandy and Suzanne, followed by our top 10 fauna games just one week after that. Support for this podcast comes from listeners like you. Thank you for spreading the word. And speaking of support... The Jack Vassell Memorial Fund is dedicated to providing support to members of the board gaming community in their hour of need. Find out more about the fund's mission and how you can help at jackvassell.org. The Dice Tower is produced by Tom, Mandy, Suzanne, and Eric, with production assistance from Roy Canada, Mike Delisio, and Rob Seary. Our theme was composed by Timothy Pinkham. Our rejection of the Jungle Book remake that leaves out a main character brought to you by Nobaloo? Nah. 
and you can get the latest on everything Dice Tower at Dicetower.com. We love feedback. Visit the Dice Tower Guild at BoardGameGeek.com, email us at podcast at Dicetower.com, or follow us on Facebook. And of course, you can find more from the Dice Tower Network, including all the bits, men on board, cardboard and wine, sporadically bored, board game design lab, tabletop game talk, the family gamers, the portal gaming podcast, this game is broken, and board game breakfast at Dicetowernetwork.com. Until next time, from all the gang at the Dice Tower, have fun gaming. So seriously, Suzanne, how many other Q games did you have ready to go in case your top ten was unable to, uh, to fulfill their duties? Oh, seriously, I have at least a dozen more. Are you kidding me? I'm not what? even joking around here. <laughs> what, are you, what, are you, what are you even talking about? I mean, we got – I had Queen Domino on my list and there's – yeah. Q is the best letter. I love Q. <laughs> what? Q is the best letter of all the letters. Okay.